everybody again. Kevin, your host, uh, the marketing director at UX at UW. Um, really glad you guys tuned in. Um, we have an amazing, two amazing guest speakers with us today from the Drunken Podcast. Uh, they will be talking about uh, telehealth and uh, the UX behind that. Um, they are both very knowledgeable in their fields, and I will stop talking and let them introduce themselves. Everybody give it up for a drunk con- drunken podcast, Mike and Aaron. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and thank you for inviting us to come on and talk to all the students here at the University of Washington. We're really excited to be able and share a little bit about what we know about all of this kind of stuff. Uh, I am your co-presenter, Michael Feenan. And I'm your other other presenter, Aaron Hill. How you doing, Michael? I'm doing all right. I'm I'm doing a, a little bit okay here. Um, we're going to be talking <laughs> about the art of accessibility, the art of usability, and how these things sort of collide into this concept we think of as inclusive design, and, and why this matters to, to all these uh, nice kind folks behind the monitor. Uh, my name's we Michael. Don't... Oh. Go ahead, go ahead, Michael. Oh, I, I was just going to introduce myself, but if if you want to introduce me, that's fine. I was I was just going to say that um, Michael and I are not health professionals, and we have limited experience with telehealth, mainly as clients or as patients. Um, so our stuff is going to stay more in the lane of where our expertise is, which is on usability and accessibility and inclusive design in general. Um, we'll try to bridge the gap to telehealth where possible, but we don't want to speak to things we don't have expertise on. Sure, sure. But everybody, welcome to the Drunken UX presentation. Uh, I am Michael. I'm a senior front-end developer over at a company called Aquent. Um, I was formerly the CTO at the interactive map platform company, New Cloud, and also was director of web marketing for Pittsburgh State University here in the wild state of Kansas. Um, I'm terrible at building slide decks, and so I apologize in advance for sort of the um, juvenile second-rate design that is going to proceed uh, in, in these slides. If you want to find me at any point, just look up my last name. I'm Feenan. I, I'm pretty much that everywhere except Instagram, or I'm M. Feenan. What's up with the Instagram changing weird people's names, right? <laughs> That's the place where our name is different. Uh, my name's Aaron. I live in upstate New York. Uh, I am a senior backend dev in Ruby on Rails. I work at Radius Networks, which is a DC company. Um, I've also worked at USCIS, Bold Penguin in Ohio, I uh, briefly worked at Home Chef, and I've worked at Cornell University as well. That's Michael and I met at uh, through higher ed. Right. Um, I'm awesome at slideshows, and you can find me by the name Armahillo pretty much everywhere. Um, GitHub is where I'd like you to see me, but you can also go to see me on Twitter if you want to see shit posting. Oh, sorry, uh, crap <laughs> posting. <laughs> That's what okay. are you drinking, Michael? Uh, this evening, uh, I am drinking from the uh, valleys of uh, my local neighborhood uh, grocery store. Uh, Allure Aloe. It's an aloe vera, mangosteen, and mango juice cocktail with absolutely no alcohol in it. <laughs> this evening, I've got uh, from the glorious people at Snap, Snap, Snaple, Snap, Snapple, raspberry tea. I'm just kidding. It's Snapple. It's a raspberry tea. <laughs> it's delicious. Um, so, I used to drink the bees by the pitcher at Applebee's many, many years ago when I was a 20 or something. So <laughs> we were going to talk about these ideas of usability and accessibility. You'll hear these words thrown around a lot. Hopefully you've heard them in some of your classes and, and learnings over the uh, past few years. This, these ideas tend to follow each other in a very close lockstep. Um, and so we want to help you understand kind of how these things interplay and why they matter. Um, and, and how we think of them sort of in the professional industry when we're building things and, and what happens there. So um, this is kind of an idea. I was trying to visualize, like, how do usability and accessibility relate to design in general? And I, I was visualizing it as this idea of kind of preparing to go on, like, a hike that might involve camping or you know, uh, sketchy terrain, that kind of thing. And accessibility is like preparing the things that you need to, like your backpack, your shoes, your canteen, these things that you need in order to be able to do the hike at all. Accessibility is 
in a technical perspective, like, you know, can you see and read the website? Can you see what's on the screen? Can you interact with it like anyone can? And we need to like all equalize to that. Everyone needs to have water for the hike. Everyone needs to have foot covering. It's appropriate for them. You need to have something to put your, your stuff in and your carrier tent and all that. And then usability is more like making the experience of the hike as like reducing the friction as much as possible, which can be things like signposts and pathways and if appropriate stairways. Um, here in Ithaca, we have lots of beautiful hiking trails, but they're also very steep. So there are lots of stairs on all of them. And then once you've solved or addressed both of those issues, then you can get to the actual experience itself and really focus on the design and uh, just the every, everything else really. But you have to satisfy accessibility. You have to get your gear first and then you concern yourself with making sure that like you can reduce the friction as much as possible and then everything else comes into play. Yeah. So it, what we're getting to is this idea of accessibility being kind of foundational to everything that you do in design. Accessibility comes first. Should. That's the key word there. <laughs> You'll hear a lot of times about people working on accessibility after after the fact or doing remediation. Um, if you pay attention to the field at all, you know there are a lot of lawsuits that are happening over the last three years. Um, the, the rate has roughly tripled, um, give or take. Uh, and... The pr reason these problems exist is because we don't treat it as foundational frequently enough. Why does any of this matter? Number one is real simple. In this country, we have 328 million people. 51 million of them have some amount of disability that affects their ability to use a website. It's roughly a sixth of our population. And there's another interesting uh, fact about this. Keep this number kind of in your head, though, for the moment. 60% <laughs> of people who use screen readers feel that content accessibility has gotten worse over the recent years. Could, could you clarify for the audience what a screen reader is? Um, I Don't worry, I will tell you what it is. I, I know this is for you more than them. Um, so a screen reader is a way that somebody who has a visual impairment, um, they can't see the screen well or at all, they will use a screen reader literally to read the screen to them. It tells them what they are seeing. Um, these can be built into browsers. They can be part of the operating system. Um, phone usage of screen readers has increased by like 70% over the last five years. Um, so this is a way of somebody who can't see content learning what's on their page, uh, which is very important to their ability to complete tasks. Mm -hmm. uh, of users who have some sort of disability that affects them with the web, 71% of them will leave a website that's not accessible. This is a baseline usability stat that's telling you, like, these people, that 51 million number, 71% <laughs> of those people will leave a website if they can't use it because of their disability, if they aren't like being rough. served. It's it's a really... Only 35 million, I think. Yeah, yeah. Huge yeah. number in that case. Now, in, the, in this study from Crown Peak, they did a, a scan of the Fortune 100 companies. These are the biggest companies corporations in the United States. They found among those sites, 815,600 WCAG compliance issues at those companies. Okay, so I'm asking for a friend. What's WCAG? Uh, WCAG, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. So these are that's, the things that tell that, us how to make something accessible. That's that's the ones that are put out by the W3, right? Right, the, yes. Yeah. W3 Consortium. W3 the people is... really like that html yes and everything yeah they're the guys uh, and gals that are behind that um so these issues this number is small i want to be clear because the thing is those scans can only automate so many detections a lot of WCAG compliance is done through manual tests so this 815,000 number is actually much higher when you factor in the number of things that would have to be remediated through manual testing here's the stat though that i love of that number, 815,000, 86% of them violated WCAG level A. A is the good one, right? A, like that's top rating, A uh, grade? A is uh, a, a rating, yes. It is the <laughs> lowest level, lowest bar to get over, basically. It's the minimum standard. There's A, there's double A, and then there's triple A. Um, oh, like bond ratings. So okay. We're talking about only 14% were among the, the medium and high level compliance standards. 86% of them were missing things like putting alt text on images, making sure your compliant or your, your contrast compliance was correct. 
These things mm -hmm. are easy to do if you know a little bit about those standards and start studying how to bake them into your design process from the start. But here's the thing, right? 51 million people in this country with disabilities, you're going to be one of them. Think about the fact that, yeah, some of you folks who are watching and listening to this right now, you are not not disabled. Another way that we think about this is you're <laughs> temporarily abled. You're young, probably. You're, I'm sure, have keen eyesight. You're not an old man like me yet. You, you, my, my wrist was hurting me the other day. I had to wear a brace on it for a while. It Im impeded my ability to use a mouse. Like, everybody <laughs> can always become disabled at any point. Maybe not permanently, but you're always throughout life going to interact with things in different ways based on what abilities you have. There's a lot of ways this can factor in. So maybe that's fine motor controls. Maybe that's an issue uh, with dy dyslexia. Dyslexia affects between 5 and 17% of the entire United States population. You may have issues with color contrast or picking out colors, like having been colorblind. This one in 10 men is colorblind to some degree. Hmm. Uh, you can also have uh, issues, neurological issues, like sensitivity to flashing. If you see a lot of motion on screen, it can make you dizzy or give you headaches. And you may have other reading comprehension problems. These are all things that can come and go with some people. Um, and this doesn't get into things like, hey, I broke my wrist, you know, let's say. Or maybe I got an ear infection and I can't hear right now. There's a lot of things, these what we call temporal problems. They're only there for a limited amount of time, but they can affect the way that you interact with the things around you. Let's take one I, of these. I find... I, I find that um, auditory processing is difficult for me sometimes. And so when I'm watching a video, whether it's a movie on my television or like a video on YouTube or something, when I can have closed captioning enabled, it makes it so much easier for right. me to be able to take, take the content in because then I don't have to like spend the extra effort to decode the audio in my brain. Yeah. Some people simply process information in different ways better. So... If we take the high number, I said between five and fifteen percent, or five and seventeen percent of Americans have uh, dyslex dyslexia in the United States. That can be upwards of fifty-five million people. Think about how this would impact them. For instance, everybody's had to use a CAPTCHA at some point, or maybe you use something that has two-factor authentication. Imagine for a moment that you have a you have problems reading letters and numbers in the order that they appear in. Or maybe uh, you have problems discerning anything that's got funny shapes associated with it, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine how that first CAPTCHA could be problematic in trying to figure out what it says. Or All right, look, I swear I see a V at the beginning. I think it's just a scribble. Yeah. But I would totally type a V there. Is it a v? I don't have dyslexia, but... <laughs> that's the problem. And yeah. when we think about this, CAPTCHAs in particular pose really significant uh, accessibility challenges. If we get into something like the, the little puzzle piece ones, um, Cloudflare used to use these. I don't know if they still do, um, but you have to drag the puzzle piece to where it goes and then slide the little activator bar underneath it, both using fine motor control. So if you don't have <laughs> good control of your mouse, this can pose a significant barrier to entry for somebody with the technology that they're using. So let's talk about what we can do about the accessibility side of things. Because here's the thing. WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, provide checkpoints. It's basically a list of things to do. That's very, I, I would say, very easy. Um, it's a long <laughs> list, trust me. But it's a very clear list. It's like you do these things, you meet the legal requirements. I hate that because you shouldn't do things under threat of legal consequences. And throughout the rest of this talk, we're going to kind of explain why there are more reasons to get into this stuff besides just the legal aspect. But for the WCAG checkpoints in particular, think about things like how they provide guidance for the markup that you may be writing or engaged with or de dealing with content creation or design elements. So some examples of this that are very simple, things that you could go check on a website right now. Make sure if you're including an image that is in any way informational related to the page, provide alternative text for it. Very straightforward. Make sure if you have something clickable, that it's not an icon that's 16 pixels by 16 pixels. Minimum hitbox sizes should be 44 pixels according to WCAG level AA. And then another common one is color contrast. We love putting like, 
you know, whites and grays together sometimes, or whites and blues together. But minimum contrast for accessibility is four and a half to one. And there are a thousand tools that can help you deal with that and measure those numbers. You don't have to know them off the top of your head. But those are things that are very simple remediation efforts that start to hit some of these things to help out folks who are using your site. There are actually um, a number of browser plugins that can also help with this. Go check out Wave or check out Axe. Um, those are two very good ones. Andy uh, from the Social Security Administration, um, they provide a tool as well. And I have one that I really like, which is the front-end uh, CSS linter accessibility.css. And you can just Google that and, and find it on GitHub. They have a version you can drop into your site development, so it will just show up on your site. Or they have a browser plugin to let you use it anywhere that you want to use it just by clicking the button. But it will highlight common markup problems that can make a page hard for somebody to read or understand. Very, very simple, but very quick. Um, another thing you can do is make sure you test your work with assistive technologies. And what do I mean by that? I'm thinking, for instance, those screen readers we talked about. Well, you can go download JAWS or NVDA. Those things are free. I think JAWS is free. I may have to double check that. I know NVDA is. Um, Chrome has, has one built in too. Yeah, Chrome has one. And uh, most operating systems have one baked in as well. Um, you just have to go through your accessibility settings to turn it on. But spend some time once in a while and turn one on and listen. Whatever you're building, is it a website, is it a web application, a mobile application? Turn it on and listen to the way it reads your site and see if it makes sense. If you, at, at UW, I'm assuming you, you might have some kind of like assistive technologies person or hopefully department. Um, if you have someone there that actually uses JAWS or a screen reader or something, and you can get an appointment with them to actually see them use it, it is mind blowing and life changing. And I had the joy of getting to do this early in my career and it has stuck with me ever since. I've not, not forgotten it. And this was over over 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. Yeah, it. believe me, using it yourself is only the tip of the iceberg because yeah, it's yeah. The, the speed with which people consume information that way who have been doing it for decades well, yeah, it's it's absolutely mind blowing the difference, but it also emphasizes why you need to talk to those people when you're building stuff for them. Uh, some other things you can do: make sure you throw away your mouse once in a while. Try to use whatever it is you're making with the keyboard, and make sure it's keyboard navigable. Uh, put your browser in high contrast mode. See what it does to your CSS and your design, um, and make sure you use browser zoom. See what mm. happens to that page if somebody blows it up. So I, I think the WCAG standard is um, it has to maintain flow up to 400% is the number. Um, hmm. The last thing, user test. So for instance, those screen reader users, get them in a room at some point. Have one try something that you're building and see if they can do what it is you want them to do. All of this is for not if you don't spend time talking to actual human beings and not proxying your own experiences through what you build or what you design. That will get you so much farther down that road to understanding the different ways that people consume information. And it's going to lead into what we're talking about when it comes to inclusive design. All right. So we're, we're going to try this experiment where I'm using a an app on my phone to advance the slides with the remote. Um, and we're going to find out if that works because <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if it's going to or not. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about usability. Oh, wait, did that work? It worked, but it went the wrong direction. Yes, there we go. Okay, cool. All right, so um, this is a quote from the Nielsen Norma Group. You're all smart people. You can read that yourself. But I'd like to talk to you a little bit about who the Nielsen Norma Group is because uh, it's, it's Jacob Nielsen and Donald Norman. And if you've been in the usability game at all for a while, those names should be instantly recognizable. Uh, Jacob Nielsen has been doing usability studies and user testing for, uh, man, since the 90s, I think. Definitely since the very early 2000s, a very long time. Um, he's written books. He's has had multiple websites. He was, I think, a consultant for Sun for a while. Um, Donald Norman wrote The Design of Everyday Things and- Many, many other uh, books. <laughs> Yeah, I have a couple of them. Design of Everyday Things is a little academic in a read, 
and it's a little dense, but it's it's very engaging and it's fascinating. And I highly recommend reading it if you get a chance to. Um, but this like usability is um, something that you have to factor in, not at the end as an afterthought, but as a, a way or as an approach of how you're designing your product, whatever your product is. Um, one of the concepts that Donald Norman talks about in his book, and actually other usability people talk about it frequently too, is affordances, which are um, things like, uh, let me compare this. Like if you go to a website for the first time, or if you pick up a product from your local appliance store or something, and you're interacting with it, you're gonna look at it and you're gonna say like, um, okay, well, can I tap this? Can I click on it? How do you interact with it? You have to learn how to engage with the product, whatever the product is. Affordances mean that you are adding things to the product that are familiar to the user to reduce the friction of having to learn how to interact with it. So we know what light switches look like. They're pretty standard. We know what light bulbs look like. They're a pretty standard shape. I think there's actually an ISO specification for the, the diameter of the screws on the light bulbs. Um, these are things that like the fact that they're standard means that you can go to any house and you can probably figure out how to turn the lights on and off in most houses. And that's, that's really important because if you don't know how to do that, if you have to relearn every time you go to someone's house, it's going to be very frustrating. And it's going to be a poor user experience. So in a good example is these are called Norman doors. Um, so <laughs> the one on the left is a comic from uh, Gary Larson, the far side. And it's, you know, a little bit of irony there. Um, but the one on the right is a real world example. And you can see both the doors look identical, but they had to add instructions to the doors so that people know how to interact with them. That's a design failure. You shouldn't have to add that. The, the uh, if you're designing an interface correctly, it should be easy to use correctly and hard to use incorrectly. So a better example would be this one, which is, uh, the link is in the bottom there for the source. Um, this is great. The, the push one has a flat panel. You can't pull it. You can't use it incorrectly. And technically, the one on the right side, you could push it. I mean, you can push any kind of door. It's a vertical surface. But it has a handle there, which suggests you can pull it. So it makes it easy to pull, which suggests that you should pull it. And that's good design. It's easy to use, easy to learn how to interface with it. And that's just a door. Um, if you have a website or any kind of application or something technical and you put a save icon, um, Michael and I are old enough that we remember three and a half inch floppies. Maybe some of you have seen them before, but um, younger people don't. And they're, you know, maybe they've used CD-ROMs, uh, but you don't usually save to a CD. Probably everyone's used USB sticks, but those don't really have like a consistent design. So it's hard to use that as an icon. Um, so instead of using an icon like that, that may or may not be kind of uh, anachronistic, I guess, um, just use a beveled button like this and use the word save. Make the intent very clear. Um, the fact that it's a bevel is providing an affordance that suggests it can be pressed or it can be pushed. So that means that it's clickable. And that is an easier kind of thing to interface with than um, maybe something that's unclear about its intent. Um, so if you've ever heard of the, the phrase, uh, mess around and find out, um, <laughs> so in, in the book, Design of Everyday Things, Norman talks about these two concepts that I think are really cool um, and are great in when you're approaching how you want to interact with uh, or how you want to like view accessibility in your product. Um, the Gulf of Execution is refers to the period of time from when you first you know, lift the cloth off the product and you're looking at it and you're trying to figure out how do we interact with it. And this is where affordances become really important because the affordances help you quickly learn what kinds of things you can do with it. If it's a button, you can push it. If it's a switch, you can flip it. If it has a spout on it, something probably comes out. Um, and the Gulf of Execution are, is you're asking questions like, what can I do? Um, what can I, how can I learn more about this? Um, what kinds of experiments you can do to, while you're playing with it? And unlabeled buttons, or as uh, Steve Krug calls them, uh, mystery meat navigation, generally unhelpful. 
um, it's better to have a button that has labels on it and where the, the task that can be accomplished by interacting with it is clearer to the user. Uh, and then find out is the gulf of valuation. That's after you've interacted, after you've done something with the thing, is it clear that your, uh, your task is complete? I've clicked the save button. How do I know if it's saved? You know, is, does it show something on the screen that says success? Does it just silently sit there and you just assume that it, or hope that it did? Um, do you have to open up your like traffic analysis and look and see if the request like bounced back or anything? Um, it's, it's important to provide your user the assurance that their task is done and that they have successfully completed it. Because if you don't, then they're going to be wondering they they're the task that they're coming in with that they want to complete they can't close that tab out in their brain as long as they don't know that the task has been completed so the gulf of valuation gives them feedback to say you are good to close that tab in your brain so go for it um and so <laughs> this is from a meme um and so in this case uh, Thanos has a cool hat on his head, which means that he is successfully like everyone he loves has died. If you've seen the Avengers movie, you'll get the joke. Um, <clears throat> but it's it's important to have some kind of feedback to the user that their task has successfully completed. Um, the last thing I want to talk about for usability is cognitive load. And this is kind of, um, this is like the, the browser tab that I was talking about in your brain. It's the more things you have going on at once, the more tabs you have open in your brain that you have to keep track of and keep running. This is like kind of using your working memory to keep all of these active and going. Um, I call it like juggling, but with your mind. Um, like you've got a guy here and this, this person is uh, metaphorically interacting with like a website and he's trying to find a job on a website. And so each of these balls represents a different like browser tab he's got open in his head. And I'd like to point out that like, one of these things is uh, the one that says, oh, I made notes here. Um, the one that says the site calls jobs careers, that's something that they've had to learn about your site. And so this is, that one is an opportunity to create an affordance. Um, Steve Krug in the book, Don't Make Me Think, he talks a lot about don't use cute words for things, use the words that are familiar to people. Most people are using other sites on the internet. And so you want to like use the knowledge that they've gained on those other sites as much as possible because it will make the experience easier. The actual task this user wants is where can they find salary ranges? And so they had to learn that the job, the site calls jobs careers, but also this person has to remember because they're a human, other stuff in their life. So that they're, they have to pick up some groceries on the way home. Um, they have a parking meter that is 45 minutes left that they have to get to. And then there's just some random ticking noise in the background. And maybe it's one of the 72 browser tabs they have open. So all these things are part of their own human experience that are completely separate from the interface that they're dealing with. And um, I've got an example, a personal one that I want to bring up later because it'll fit better with something Michael's going to talk about. But the point here though, is that your users are humans and whatever pristine vacuum you're designing your, your, your interface in it is going to have to collide with a complicated human being at some point. And that complicated human being is going to bring all of this chaos that they have in their own experience and run that into your interface. A, a human and who so, may be in crisis too, because keep in mind, if you're if yeah. you're talking about, especially the subject of telehealth or anything in the healthcare industry, mm -hmm. people seek out that care most frequently when they are in trouble. And so they have that added burden associated with them. We we are terribly, you know, not preemptive <laughs> in medical care too frequently. So if I am already in crisis for something, that's one more ball. And in many cases, maybe a big one. Yeah, maybe a medicine ball, ball uh, to yeah. pin another metaphor. <laughs> uh, I just, but just to reiterate, like these balls that are in the air that this person is juggling, I arbitrarily picked these the number is probably actually much bigger. And the what you want to do when you're designing your interface is to minimize the number of balls, browser tabs, whatever you want to, metaphor you want to use, minimize the number that they have to take on to get the thing they need to do done. 
Um, the book Don't Make Me Think by Steve Krug, it's a very easy read. It's not, I think it's maybe 100 pages, lots of pictures and graphics and things. It's excellent. I love it. And his whole thing is about reducing cognitive load as much as possible. And the, the phrase don't make me think is referring to don't make me think about what I need to do to interact with your site. Don't, um, what he's saying is reduce the cost, reduce the gulf of execution as much as possible. Make it really clear what I can do and how to do it. And then don't make me think about the things that I've have in process that I don't know if they're done or not. Reduce the gulf of evaluation as well. Um, because the user experience isn't how many clicks it takes to get from the homepage to the salary ranges. The user experience is how much do I have to think about how to get from there to there? Or in a telehealth example, um, how do I get the care that I need as quickly as possible, um, even though I'm like bleeding or whatever, <laughs> whatever the situation may be. Um, so when we talk about these, these concepts, right, accessibility is a checklist, basically. There, there, there is a finite number of things you can do to make a website accessible. And if you do those things, you probably have succeeded. Usability is an outcome. It's a, it's a product. It's a byproduct of good processes, good techniques, and, and good execution. So what we want to do now is talk about inclusive design because what, what inclusive design does is it takes these kind of ideas, smashes them together, and anchors them for you in a repeatable process that you can then apply to the way you work. So if you go over to uh, the Inclusive Design Toolkit, they've got this. They say the that inclusive design is the design of mainstream products and or services that are accessible to and usable by as many people as reasonably possible without the need for special adaptation or specialized design. What does that mean? That's this idea that I mentioned earlier, for instance. like Accessibility deals with things like if the user is blind, then this should be the thing you do. But it doesn't care as much about the user is blind for the moment, but maybe won't be later. Or if the user is outside in the sun and there's glare on their screen and they can't see it very well. There's a lot of use cases that start to fall in. And, and what we learn with inclusive design is that a lot of these actions you take for the purposes of accessibility actually have much larger broad spectrum benefits. So the way I say this is, Inclusive design is, de is designed to keep you honest to yourself and to your process. So you're going to hear a lot of words thrown around sometimes in, in conjunction with this. You'll hear inclusive design. You'll also hear things like accessible design or universal design and uh, ethical design if you want to go that direction. And you may ask, well, what's the difference between all of these? And there are subtle differences between them, but there's a huge amount of overlap. I was uh, going through the wrong slides, wasn't I? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I, I thought maybe my screen was Nope, lagged, nope that was but... me. Uh, okay. by my apologies. <laughs> I've got notes on one side and, and slide deck on the other. Uh, so this idea, they overlap. They have a lot in common, but they are subtly different. But it's okay to kind of use them a little bit interchangeably. The, I think maybe one of the best ways to kind of phrase this is an idea of thinking about something called kind design. I like, I like kind, kind design. Kind design, yeah. right? Because you're trying to make something good for the user that they can, you know, complete their task with, whatever that may be. Because here's the thing. If you think about accessibility and usability in a vacuum, what you get is sort of this austere kind of antiseptic build because <laughs> you can build something that is technically usable and is technically accessible <laughs> that is still bad we actually okay go ahead. kindness means kindness means factoring in that humans are using your product and that the the audience of the kinds of humans that are using your product um might have uh, additional complexities when they collide with your user interface. So what happens when you don't do kind design? We have a name for it. It's like the, like the opposite. It's <laughs> like literally the opposite of being kind. It's hostile design. You may also hear this called dark patterns, uh, depending on where you're reading. But hostile mm -hmm. design is incompatible with inclusive design. 
They are diametrically opposed and they cannot be done together because hostile design is all about when you learn about user experience and user research and user testing, you learn very powerful techniques to figure out what users want and how users work. Now you have a choice to make. What are you going to do with that information? What are you going to do with that power? Mm -hmm. Because you can use that power for good or you can use that power for evil. And hostile design is where mm -hmm. that comes in to working for evil. All of us have probably dealt with this over the last couple months. We all filed our taxes probably um, or have in the past. Hopefully. hopefully. Uh, <laughs> and universally, most people have complaints about the software they use to do that if you did it with software. They're constantly trying to upsell you. They're constantly trying to get you to use something that you don't need or don't want. This is a screenshot from TurboTax, and there's a little link that is uh, highlighted in the lower left. I have a service code. What does that mean? Well, that means your employer at some companies, they will pay for you to use TurboTax, just kind of like insurance and other things. Your company went to TurboTax and said, we've got a 1,000 employees. We want them to use your software. Cut us a deal, and we'll let them use it. And so they may come out and say, you know what, uh, fine, it's $75 a user. But if they can get you to pay $129.98, well, that's not their fault. You didn't click <laughs> the link. In my mind, using a service code, you'll see there's a button there that says view payment options. Well, I have a service code. My service code is my payment option. That's the way I'm going to pay for this, the way my employer told me. And instead, they de-emphasize that link and intentionally try to misdirect you to do the wrong thing and double dip. Now your employer has paid for your code, but you've also paid to use the service even more. These are Tur hostile design patterns. TurboTax is actually really, really bad at this, about this, and they have, like, resisted legislation that would improve it. <laughs> so... There are a lot of hostile design patterns, and this list is not all-inclusive, and we will come up with new categories as technology changes, as websites change, but things like trick questions, roach motel, hidden costs, confirm shaming, these are just a few of that model that... I don't think I've ever seen privacy zuckering before, that's it's, funny. Uh, there's a link in the lower right corner, you can go read all about it, uh, <laughs> but... These techniques are designed to take what we know about user experience and use them against users to get them to do things that they don't want to do. And we can't operate that way. That's not how we should be building websites. So let's put this into mm -hmm. practice a little bit. Inclusive design, I said, takes accessibility, takes usability, and bridges these things. It puts them together to make something greater than the sum of their parts. So imagine you've got a video. The video has closed captions. And immediately you think, great. I solved my accessibility problem. Somebody who's deaf can now get the content of that video and my work is done. But inclusive design says, yeah, but how does that actually help us in a much broader context and conversation? So here's your pop quiz complete with answers. <laughs> Why include subtitles with video content? Well, obviously we have taken care of the accessibility problem. We've made strict accessibility compliance. Number one is taken care of, but we've also taken care of our temporary disabilities. That person with the ear infection who can't hear right now, well, they can now take care of that. But you've also accommodated people with a temporal inconvenience. For instance, they're traveling on the subway right now, and they don't want to turn their speaker up so everybody around them hears what they're listening to. Or what about folks who are in a different location? If I work in an office every day and it's a, an open concept office, then I may not have the luxury of turning speakers on in that situation or have headphones. So you've made that content inherently accessible to a much broader group of people outside of just those simple checkpoints. I'll put this into another sort of context. Let's move this meat space. What you have is this problem with <laughs> elevators. If you build a building and realize five years later that you built a 10-story building with no elevator in it, it's going to be really hard to go back and add that elevator in, and it's going to be really expensive. Mm -hmm. When we approach this, we're really good about this in the construction space too, right? We have entire code standards uh, that tell us how to make a, a structure ADA accessible. And from the start, when we design those buildings and make those plans, we factor in ramps, we factor in automatic doors, we factor in elevators, we take care of all of these things. The elevator goes in. Yes, we've checked the box. Somebody with a wheelchair can now get to the fourth floor. But I tore my ACL a few years back. 
What about me? I'm on crutches. I benefit from the elevator. Or maybe I just got back from the gym, and I'm just looking at that staircase, and I'm saying, nah, man, I'm not doing those stairs right now. <laughs> it was leg day. Uh, I Or maybe you're just tired. I, I, I'm just lazy. Uh, <laughs> that elevator literally benefits everyone, even though if people were allowed, they would cut that from their list. They would say, oh, that's a four-story building. It's not a big deal. I can walk up those steps. I substitute my experience for everybody else, and I want to save that money. But we don't. Same thing with um with wheelchair access ramps too. Right. A, a ramp. Everyone can walk up. A everyone ramp. can walk up a ramp. Uh, so this is what happens when inclusive design starts to think about your spatial relations. One more good example: thinking about uh, parking spaces. So when we talk about accessible design, there is an ADA standard that tells you if you have 25 parking spaces, you need one of them to be ADA accessible. If we look on the right, we see five handicap parking spaces. That means they have up to 150 parking spaces, and according to the ADA, one of those spaces has to be van accessible. But somebody looked at this and said, why don't we make all of them van accessible? We mm -hmm. can do that. We can take these spaces that are good for everybody who needs access to the, the walkway there and to get where they're going, and we can make this design better. And instead of meeting the minimum letter of the law, we can design this space inclusively to accommodate anybody who wants to park there. So let's just make all of them van accessible. That person was very so smart. I have a, the, the experience that I mentioned earlier that is relevant here is um, I was looking for a, um, a psychiatrist to that I could prescribe me ADHD medication because I am neurodivergent and executive dysfunction can make it very hard to do things. What I got was this literally, I think it was six pages long intake form. It was, it was on the web, but it was like six or more pages of all the stuff that I had to fill out, including things that I had to write. It literally took me two weeks to fill that out um, for exactly the reason that I was trying to see this person. So this person was, knows the, the difficulty that I'm having and the reason why I'm coming to them in the first place and still made me do this thing. It's like, like, oh, well, we know you're having trouble breathing, so climb all these stairs up here and then tell us. Right. <laughs> so I'm going to end on uh, a quote here. This comes from uh, an article over at Top Tall. They say, these barriers, and when they say these barriers, they mean like the things that prevent folks from doing something, that six-page form. These are often created inadvertently during the design process when designers create products for people like themselves. What that means is we're not mean-spirited we're not out to make bad things it's just that we don't realize sometimes the things we're doing if we aren't constantly testing they go on to say by employing inclusive design methodology and empathizing with diverse groups of people designers can create products that are accessible to all so when you get into this space understand the web changes technology changes people change the goal you should have is getting up every day and thinking about making something you are proud of, <laughs> making something that moves people in the right direction, and make sure that you test those assumptions and fix things as they change, because they will always change. And that is not a failure. It's not something broken. It's just that people adapt. Technology changes. We, we will have tools next year that we don't have now. We will have ways of using websites at 10 years from now that we don't have now. And that will impact the way we design and build websites. And so, and I think to go, to expand on that a little bit with the point from earlier, um, the be, being kind means remembering that humans are using your right. product. And especially like in the health field, like what kinds of challenges and difficulties will these humans specifically be facing? And will that factor in their ability to interact with the product we're making? It, it's at the end of the day, I, I was a communications major in college, and there's a, a lot of different methodologies of communication. And one of them that I've always spoken to and I really love uh, emphasizing is this idea that at the end of the day, everything that we do on the internet boils down to one human being trying to interact with another human being, and everything else is in the way. And so our job as designers, as developers, is to minimize all that noise that is in between those two people. 
So that's your job, and that's what I'm setting you off to go do with what we've been talking about here. And I hope that this has helped you and, and turned you on to some new stuff and gives you something to go look at and research and, and just think about. <laughs> Michael, that entire time I kept waiting for you to say, keep your personas close and your nope. users closer. <laughs> that happens at the end, which means if folks want to find out more about us, we are the Drunken UX podcast. Uh, if you go to drunkenux.com slash UX at UW, uh, that will get you a list of links for everything we have from subscribing to the show to uh, following us on the, the social medias. Uh, otherwise, I mean, you can do with all of this what you will. Um, I also emphasize this has nothing to do with the talk, but do less better. Don't do everything badly. <laughs> do less better. Because uh, when you when you do that and you focus on that, you realize that uh, you just have to keep your personas close and your users close. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Thanks for having us, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Amazing. I'm also happy to answer questions. Thank you guys so much. That was very insightful. Appreciate all of that. Um, yeah, I definitely got a lot from that wonderful <laughs> um i'm sure our listeners did as well uh just gotta refresh here check out um let's want to gauge the everyone viewing uh see if they have any questions you can start typing them in but um right off the bat i had, did have a couple of thoughts too that i wanted to share with you guys because mm -hmm. um yeah it definitely took away a lot um I actually am also a communication major as well. Uh, my experience in UX is fairly limited, actually, but um, our president of our club actually very nicely uh, invited me to be the marketing director. And throughout this whole process of three quarters, I have learned so much about design and integration of user experience and user interface and how it's just constantly surrounding us. Um, and I'm absolutely in love with it now. So. Um, yeah, that's really cool. You guys touched on some really I, interesting topics. I love to tell folks, yes, I was a communications major, but I was more than that because I was I actually was a theater major of all things um, in college. <laughs> and I have been building web I, I started building websites in the nineteen nineties, uh, and I've been doing it professionally for the last fifteen years. Um, it uh, anybody can get into this space and I encourage them and I love communication majors because of that exact thing I talked about. Everything we do is about helping people interact with each other. Even though you may think, well, I'm just using that computer, whatever. Well, yeah, but somebody has to fulfill that order or, or you're trying to get information on, you know, if you've ever like done uh, research on any kind of medical situation, you know that there's a ton of just terrible websites out there with information on all these diseases or, or conditions that are really there to sell you something or get in the way. Um, and it's really speaks volumes to how far we have to go to really distill our processes down to something more pure, I think. And it's going to yeah. be a long road, but the, the comm majors of the world uh, are there to change <laughs> it. So I have faith in you. Uh, that that helps me that makes me feel a little bit better so <laughs> appreciate that. and we actually have a question in the chat regarding communication major as well um dayton as being a comm major do you find yourself having skill sets or knowledges that other designers don't usually have um what i'll say is i can always teach people to code Code is relatively simple um, when you really boil it down. The thing that comm people are always uh, consistently good at is the human side of our work. Um, when you, especially if you work at a large company where you may have a development team, you may have a marketing team, you may have a content team, you have a DevOps team, you've got all of these disparate people all coming together to make a website run. And the people who understand how to talk to all of those people and interact with them on their level are the ones that sort of make the wheel turn. You know, they operate as that hub because it's very easy for, and this is not a knock on computer science or anything, but there, there are types of developers who are just really good at development, but they aren't necessarily good at explaining those concepts to a marketer, for instance. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. that, that's just something not everybody's good at, but the, the people who can emphasize crossing those borders 
will find themselves, I think, in, in very good spaces to coordinate and facilitate. I, I wasn't a comms major. I was a chemistry major, but um, I, I did work with the communications department for about four years. And I can confirm that like the, the audience centered focus of working with communications is a really, really great segue into user centered design and, and just kind of um, focusing on the, the, the human portion of, of the thing you're developing and not just on like yeah. the code itself. Human centered design yeah. is also another one of those phrases that you'll hear kind of mm -hmm. used in tandem with inclusive design very much. I still like kind, kind design. design. I know we just started talking about that earlier today, but I really like that wording. Yeah, kind of bridging the gap between um, the company and the product and the people that are going to use it and mm -hmm. all the intricacies and between that. I you, it. Anybody doing uh, usability has a responsibility in my eyes to advocate mm -hmm. for those users, the folks sure. behind on the yeah. other side of the monitor that you never see because business will always try to steamroll the fastest solution, the cheapest solution, and mm -hmm. frequently what suffers is testing and research. Mm. That's really insightful. Thank you. Um, chat's still open for questions if you have any, um, but I also had wrote down another one and would be interested sure. in getting you guys' thoughts about uh, podcasts in general. Uh, it is an industry that is certainly blowing up recently, um, I think, just amidst the pandemic, whether that's just people bored in their house or think they <laughs> have thoughts that they would like to share out with everybody else. But um, being a platform so auditory uh, pertaining to only one sense and you talking about all of this telehealth, uh, how do you kind of incorporate features and designs into podcasts to cater to a fuller experience um, to whether that's, yeah, like visual or other senses? Um, and it, yeah. We, well, the one thing we, we constantly beat the accessibility drum and we do our best as two people running a podcast for what, four years now, four years um, and no money to get transcripts <laughs> four years, no funding. Um, so it's just us and we, uh, we do our best at making transcripts. Um, it is very time consuming and that time can be either satisfied by yourself or you can pay people to do it for you. Um, mm -hmm. or you can find robots, but, Robot transcription isn't great yet. Uh, yeah, transcripts are probably the most important. On like Zoom and things like that right now too, mm -hmm. like it's become a pretty common feature. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Like you, I do like reading captions. It helps me understand things a little bit. Better. Yeah, right? I, yeah. I'm real big also on making sure we get out of the podcast space once in a while. Events like this, um, I've, mm -hmm. I used to do a lot of conference speaking before COVID. Um, like getting out in front of people is very important to me. Um, I also try to marry the things that I talk about back to the podcast a little bit. I actually, uh, a couple of years back, was presenting on transcription um, at an accessibility conference over in Missouri um, and used like the work we were doing at that point to kind of marry those things together. Um, and getting out as much as I can and, you know, actually talking to human beings about stuff. Um, I, I cannot stress enough that the longer you're behind the monitor, you need to balance that with getting in front of a human as well. Um, and I actually, I, I gave a talk last year at Ruby for good. Um, it was remote, but uh, about code UX and um, like the user experience of the code itself. So like the portion of an application that no user should ever see. Um, if you do your job right, they should never see any of the code, but other developers will. And remembering that developers are also humans and have to interact with the code and the things that you can do to help um, make that, like reduce the friction as much as possible. Um, and I, I think that's something that I'm seeing mentioned a little bit more often now, but it's like historically has not been a concern. Like we developers kind of give ourselves the shaft. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, and then just, I, I guess I had another thought, uh, unless anybody in the Zoom have anything to add. I just had so much questions, like I just scribble it, my desk is covered in sticky notes. <laughs> from, um, hey, yeah, um, hey Michael, hey Aaron. Um, 
Yeah, I, I I unfortunately missed the bulk of what you guys talked about. Um, caught the kind of the tail end of this, but I'd be really curious to hear your thoughts, maybe on, on about accessibility when it comes to newer technologies like uh, VUIs um, and things like that. Um, if there's like you know appropriate times that you say would be best in terms of accessibility and when to maybe avoid these types yeah. of things. That's a real like like pioneering a new technology like the virtual world. I don't think we know what sorts of like accessibility issues there will be. And I think this is gonna defer more to the process, um, which is going to be uh, listening to like, go do as much pre-thinking as you can beforehand. But then after that, it's like meet as many different types of people and different kinds of people as possible to see what their experience is like and then find ways to make it better. I will answer very directly on that as far as like the UI goes, uh, which is a voice user interface for anybody who's unfamiliar. Uh, Oh, I thought you meant virtual user interface. Oh, I, I, I assume you talk, oh. you're talking about voice. Well, yeah. Voice. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, Aaron, <laughs> your answer still is very valid, I mean, to that point either way. Uh, but voice in particular um, has one incredibly unique and hard-to-overcome accessibility challenge, and I genuinely don't know what the solution is at this point. But um, one of the uh, key qualities of uh, usability is learnability or sometimes we use the word discoverability. Mm. And VUIs inherently hide their entire interface. You are forced to mm -hmm. guess what you can ask it. And anybody who has a Google Assistant or an Alexa has sat around once or twice asking it the dumbest questions just to see what it will <laughs> respond with. Because confirmed, <laughs> there's no other way to know everything it can do as a result. Um, they have to be paired with um, they have to be paired with some kind of tangible UI. One of the best examples I know of is Domino's Pizza, who um, has a voice ordering system that dovetails directly with their normal mobile app. And so you can actually go in with their voice ordering mm -hmm. and say, "I want a medium two topping pizza, gluten free crust with mushrooms and chicken." And has the natural language processing there to break that down and understand what you're asking for. But NLP is still very limited. It is very garbage in garbage mm -hmm. out. Um, and it can only do as much as we tell it chat bots. If anybody wants a really, really fun, uh, episode to go listen to, go to the web, the drunken UX website and search for, uh, my rant on chat bots. I was alone for an hour. <laughs> Aaron was out uh, uh, traveling that week, and so I did a solo episode where for an hour I explained why chatbots are terrible for UX. <laughs> it's pretty great. <laughs> okay. I, I, I did have a thought about that, though, about, like, the innovation of UX. You kind of touched on it, Aaron, a little bit, but mm -hmm. um, when you were talking about affordances and mm -hmm. integrating concepts that people are familiar with, Mm -hmm. Where is that kind of line drawn between keeping it familiar, but as well as maybe introducing new concepts and designs that might cater to more people? So do you remember, um, I don't know if you looked at the history of the iPhone, but when the first iPhone came out, they, Apple was really, really huge on, um, I forget the name of the design paradigm. Thank you. I, I knew exactly um, which where you were like going make, with that. Yeah. <laughs> It's making the buttons on the screen look like actual buttons that you can literally press. Like they, you give them 3D treatments. Knobs look like radio um, knobs. Yes. So they did that at first because this was a like touch screen technology was something you only saw in movies at the time. And so the idea that you might have a device in your hand that you can interface with by touching like a, a screen um, was so wild that what they realized was we need to make this as obvious as possible. And so those are the the affordances on that side. Yeah, go go look up if anybody wants to Google that. It's uh, skeuomorphism is the name of it. Um, mm -hmm. Two thousand seven was when the iPhone launched, and that was like that was the big conversation was transposing mm -hmm. uh, physical reality to a digital interface for the sake of familiarity. And we did that 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 impacted design for ten years after that. And it. And if you look at the design about, I think it was roughly 10 years after that, or at least several, um, Apple switched doing flat design. So they went away from the skeuomorphism and they went towards 
um, something that was maybe more of an aesthetic choice because they knew that we have all kind of collectively learned you can tap things on a screen yeah. and it probably that, that's that. where there towards the end of the talk when I was talking about how usability changes your users change their experiences mm -hmm. change they understand interfaces anybody uh, who has a young brother or sister now or a niece or a nephew who's three four years old watch them use a tablet and the amount of understanding they have of those interfaces at a very very young age and consider how that is going to impact how they use touch interfaces when they're 18 19 20 years old or 50 60 years old uh, because mm -hmm. this is all very that, I, I love the age I am because I literally when I went to school there was not a computer in a classroom to now I'm on the bleeding edge of building websites for, you know, a huge company and, and I'm in on all of this uh, fundamental technology that I got to own at every generation where, where it came up with us. So all of our experiences are going to be very, very different. So we just have to always be listening. We have to always be talking to those folks. I want to briefly go back to Dayton's question about the voice interfaces. Um, I, I One thing that I think that we can do with those is... Um, showing if possible showing the text of what the computer heard you say on the screen or some kind of feedback like that um, sometimes on the phone if you're doing a vui with like a um the where the computer's asking you questions and you're interfacing with that way sometimes the computer will then say back to you i think you're asking for this is that correct um that's also useful if the if that's the modality you're doing if it doesn't have a visual component um but showing the feedback of what the computer is thinking you're asking or thinking you're working with is really, really helpful for you knowing that you're being heard correctly. Just like when you're talking with a human being, for them to say back to you, I think you're saying this to me, is that right? Like that's a really effective communication technique when talking with people, um, but we need it, need it even more so with computers, especially if you're dealing with um, complicated interactions. Uh, like the Domino's example, I would expect if I was a user that when I'm saying these words to the thing, I'm expecting to see feedback on the screen that's showing me the things that I'm saying and like building it out on the screen somehow um, so that I know that I'm being heard correctly. I think you wanted to murder all Jedis. Shall I execute Order 66? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's that's sort of the, the human component though, right? Like remembering that ultimately the device is interacting with a human and you're a human creating the device. So... How can you be kind to that future human to interact with the device? Like, what can you factor in for that? Awesome. Awesome, guys. Um, thank you once again uh, for your time and sharing, dropping all of these knowledge bombs on us about UX and all the wonderful things about it. Always happy to answer um, for those questions, that too. If anybody ever wants to hunt us down on Discord or Twitter, we will always look at something or answer a question. Happy to help out anybody. Yeah, let them uh, tell everybody that came in um, a little bit late here where they can find you um, and what you have going on, um, different platforms when you guys do yeah. podcast drops, releases, and all um, that good stuff. We are at drunkenux.com. Uh, if you hit drunkenux.com slash UX at UW, uh, you will get a list of everywhere that we are from social media to subscriptions and everything in between. Um, new episodes drop every Monday. Uh, some upcoming topics we have. Uh, our latest episode was on UX research and the importance of UX research. Um, next week, we will be dropping an episode on uh, static site generators um, using Eleventy. Uh, we've also got some CSS animation stuff coming up, some website testing, um, testing automation work coming up. So plenty in the pipeline every other Monday. Uh, and otherwise, like I say, if it... I won't ramble off all our social media or nothing. You can find it on the website. So easy, easy to track down. Yeah. Perfect. And then I guess just to set, put a bow on everything. Um, I'm dying to know uh, what your guys' favorite drink is. It is called the Drunken <laughs> UX Podcast. So I need to know uh, okay, so what you guys enjoy sipping on. Michael, you answer first and then I'll say mine. And then we should say what the, like, Official yeah, yeah, yeah. UX uh, I'm a I'm a yeah. Scotch man. Uh, I am big on Scotch. I have a pretty extensive collection. I try to have something a little different on every episode. Uh, we even though we are 
drunken UX. We we don't get stupid drunk on the show. We have a drink and, and talk about what's going on. Um, typically. typically, except for when Aaron's a little <laughs> wild. The first couple, not going to lie, if you listen to the first couple seasons, there's a couple episodes where I didn't measure correctly. <laughs> it lives up to the name. Yeah. Uh, my my drink of choice kind of varies by season. Um, right now, with it getting warmer, I am all about margaritas. Um, I've been trying to find different ways of making them. My current way, my current favorite way, is to use tequila, triple sec, and fresh lime juice. Um, that's been pretty great. Uh, in the colder months, I really like uh, tangere and tonic. That's kind of my go-to. Tangere and tonic, uh, mm-hmm. official famous. drink. If anybody ever wants to join us for one, Vesper Martini. Is the the one that uh, uh, James Bond yes. makes, right? Yeah, oh, that see. was that was suggested to us by the our guest uh, Greg Pudanovich, um, who told us about design systems. And in that episode, I drank too much tequila. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to hear you me did. get drunk? That's Everyone go check that one out. Um, <laughs> go visit their website. It's on that screen right now. Uh, if we can get some applause, appreciation, love in the chat for. <laughs> Mike and Aaron giving their time. Um and yeah, thank you guys so much. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, appreciate it.